lived such a hard life as one of your children. I have questioned, shouldn't things be better for me? So many valleys and too many hills. Oh, I thought, but I was wrong. Father, I'm sorry that I didn't see. I praise the Lord that I have the opportunity, amen, just to come and be a part of this celebration. And I appreciate Sister Tiffany putting things together. Said we're going to make you a surprise for you, amen. And I tell you, I was, I'm going to tell you this story. Um, before I received the call even to come, I was in my office and actually had you on my heart, on my mind, just thinking about you. I pray for you all the time. And I'm not just saying that because I'm standing up here. I keep you on my heart. 
I thank God for you. And I want to say I thank God for those of you who are here at Haynes Baptist Church. You've got a tremendous pastor. Amen. Amen. A tremendous pastor. And I thank God for him. And I'm going to take a few moments tonight, and I'm just going to share from the Word of God uh, what I believe God would have me to give at this particular time. I want to say it's good to have my, uh, my wife here, and it's good to have our, uh, our son and our daughter-in-law here, and, and they're a blessing. I take the Secret Service snuck us in. <laughs> they had everything but the eyeglasses. They wanted us to get here at a certain time. They had the side door for us to go in and a place for us to stay back there, and they had everything worked out, and you didn't know a thing, did you? Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the way it is. They did their job, and we give God the praise. Take your Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I want to say thank you, Pastor Holly, for being here for five years. Do you know a lot of pastors, they don't make it five years. They just don't. And uh, so that's a testament in himself for, uh, for him to be able to make it here for, uh, for five years. And his being here is a tremendous thing. And of course, he couldn't make it unless he had a tremendous wife right by his side. And just like she is now on his right, I know she's there for him constantly. Matter of fact, our, um, our daughter, uh, in-law and Sister Tiffany, they, uh, they go out some time and just talk, eat, fellowship together, and uh, that's just a blessing. We thank God for her. Beside every tremendous man, you always have a tremendous woman. And you know, I was thinking, you find your way to First Chronicles chapter 21, what's a good gift? I know this is a birthday celebration and also a celebration of his being here for five years. And I was thinking, what is a great gift that could be given to him? I know you've already given several things. His family has already been able to be over this morning, and that was just tremendous, and praise the Lord for that, and, and other things that have been shared. And I was thinking when I was getting ready to prepare this, what kind of gift could each person give in this building, regardless of whether you have finances or whatever, it's not about money. What is it that you could give to him that I know a pastor's heart that he would enjoy, that would bring joy to him, would keep him going for five more years if the Lord tarries his coming. What kind of gift could you give to him? Well, you know, John put it this way. John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And well, I was thinking, if we could have a church that on an individual basis, each person who said, you know what, I'm just going to give my all. I guarantee you he'd sleep well at night. His sleep would be sweet. He would look for, I know he looks forward to coming to church, but I'm talking about he would really look forward to coming. You know, there are times when you would eat a meal and it's good. But then there are times when maybe it's that special meal where you get some macaroni and cheese and cornbread and, and collard greens and fried chicken. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you say, man, your mouth start to water. And you say, boy, I can't wait until I dive into that meal. I'm talking about that kind of, of a desire and want to when you've got a group of people who are saying, hey, I'm just giving everything I've got to him. Now, with all that in mind, let's look at the text tonight and see what God has for us. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 down through verse number 8. And when we get through, we're going to have a little fellowship over some ice cream cake and finger food. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 21. Verse 1 down through verse number 8. He says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king... Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people under David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. 
and Judah was 400, threescore and 10,000 men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Listen, there wasn't anything wrong really with taking a census per se. God had already told Moses on at least two occasions to take a census. Back in Numbers chapter 1, verse 2 and verse number 3, God told Moses to take a census. And then in Numbers chapter 26 and verse number 2, God told him to do it once again. But Satan was the one that caused David to, uh, to take this one. And see, this numbering literally could cause them to put their trust in their army or the number of their army instead of the God of their army. And so then in verse number 9 down through verse number 13, God really gave David a choice of three things that he could do because God's judgment was about to fall. And so God said, I'm going to give you three choices. And you could either have three years of famine or you could have three months destroyed by your foes or you could have three days pestilence. And David said, well, you know, I'm going to fall on God's mercy. And so David chose the, the third thing, which was the three days of pestilence. Look at verse number 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. 70,000 men lost their lives. Now look at verse 18 down through verse 23. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Onan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Onan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Onan, Onan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant me it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen, for the burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. He said, I give it all. You know what I'm going to preach on tonight? I'm going to take that little phrase that Ornan said to David in the midst of everything that was going on, and I'm going to apply it to our lives here tonight, and I'm going to preach on I give it all. Let's get some help from our Heavenly Father tonight. Father, we want to thank you tonight for allowing us to be here. Yes, oh, God, we pray even now that you might just do something unusual in this building. Father, thank you for your man that you have placed here and has been here for five years. Father, thank you for allowing him to be on this earth for the time that he has been and now celebrating a birthday. But, Father, I pray that you will finger around all of our hearts, those that are saved and maybe those that are lost. And, Father, I pray that if there's any loss, you'll save them, all that are saved. I pray tonight, please, oh God, that you would help everyone in this building to have the desire upon their hearts that Ornan had and where they'll say, I give it all. Oh, God, please move in a mighty way. Please, we turn it over to you now. Take full control. Take me out of myself. Control my mind. Help me to say those things you desire for me to say. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. For it is in Jesus' name we do ask it. And all the people of God said, Well, tonight there seems to be a missing word that we have in Christendom today. You say, What is that missing word tonight? That missing word seems to be commitment. Commitment. As I have been saved for 37 years, preaching for 34 years, pastoring for 22 and a half years, uh, one thing I've noticed and have opportunities to go here and there, one thing I've noticed is that there is a lack 
of commitment to the home, a lack of commitment to the church and to evangelize and to faithfully serve God and to fulfill responsibilities. However, praise God. God, there are those who are committed. I mean, they're faithful to their homes. They're faithful to their church. They're faithful to evangelize. They're faithful to serve God. They're faithful to carry out their responsibilities. They have the ordained spirit that says, I give it all. I give it all. Ornan was a man who was committed. David came to Ornan. In the midst, as I said, of everything that was going on. And David said, give me your threshing floor, the place where they would thresh wheat. But Ornan said, not only will I give you my threshing floor, but he said, I'm going to give you my oxen. I'm going to give you my threshing instruments. I'm going to give you that wheat that I've already threshed. I give it all you know what Pastor Holly needs? I'll tell you what he needs. He needs an army of people who will stand shoulder to shoulder with him and say on Sundays, I give it all. On Wednesdays, I give it all. On Mondays, when you go to work, I give it all. On special meetings, I give it all. He needs a group of people who are fired up in their soul to say everything I've got I'm giving it to God. Am I speaking to some young person tonight? Am I talking to some man tonight? Am I talking to some woman tonight? We need somebody who will say, I give it all. I give it all. I'm going to give you three things out of this passage because most of the time, if we get to the place to where we say, I give it all, we will ask the question, why should I give it all? Why should I give it all? I'm going to give you three reasons why I believe you could look in the passage and probably find something different. But I'm going to give you three things I see in this passage tonight as why Ornan said, I give it all. Number one, because he was thankful that he wasn't destroyed. He was thankful that he wasn't destroyed. Notice 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse number 20, it says, And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him. Watch this. Hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. I wonder why those four men, four young men, his sons, I wonder why they hid themselves. Look at verse 14 down through verse 16a. Same chapter. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Listen, if it wasn't but for the mercy of God, Ornan and his sons would have been destroyed. 70,000 people had already lost their lives. Death came right up to where Ornan was, but God in his mercy had that angel to stay his hand. And David came and David said, Ornan, I need your threshing floor. And I could see now as Ornan, as he saw that angel standing with that drawn sword, and, and, and Ornan said, listen, you can have the floor, but listen, I want to give you the oxen. I want to give you the threshing instruments for wood. I want to give you the weed. I give it all. I'm not destroyed. Hey, tonight, he was thankful that he wasn't destroyed. Let me say tonight, because of God's mercy, yes, all of us 
in this building are not destroyed. All of us are here for a purpose and for a reason. Because you are alive tonight, you ought to be saying, I give it all. I give it all. You're still alive. You're not destroyed. How many times has God healed you? How many times has God kept you from being killed in an accident? How many times has God kept you from dying when you were doing something that you should not have been doing? All of us in this building ought to say, I give it all. Verse number 20 states that old man turned back and he saw the angel. Every now and then, we need to look back and see what God saved us from. You're looking at a person tonight. Listen, there have been times when, if I could use this analogy, when the death angel or the angel of death, when this angel has come with this drawn sword, and I'm just using this as an analogy, and literally have stood over this person, but God has said, stay your hand, stay your hand. I remember when I was 11 years of age, I was in a house in South Carolina, 1970, and I was asleep in the bed. Our house caught on fire. There was fire and smoke, and I didn't, I was oblivious to it. I didn't know that the house was burning down, and our house burned down to the ground. I was on the inside of the house. All of a sudden, I felt my grandmother shaking me. After a while, my grandmother shook my two sisters, and when I Looked up, all I could see was flames of fire. All I could see was smoke. I remember running out of the house. We had just a little four-room house, and I remember running outside of the house, my, myself and my younger sister, and I looked back. All I could see was fire and smoke, but I couldn't see my grandmother. I couldn't see my sister, my older sister, and it seemed like eternity when I was standing out there and said, I said, I've got to go back in. And as an 11-year-old boy, I ran back inside of the house, but the heat and the smoke was so much until I couldn't, I couldn't stay and I had to come back. My grandmother was telling me later, she said that I was screaming and yelling and telling you to get out, to get out. And I stood there in the kitchen right before the door that leads out. And I saw after a while my grandmother, who was in her 70s, dragging my 13-year-old teenage sister out of the house. And when we got out of the house, it wasn't long before everything fell in. Listen, death was right over me. I was 11 years of age. I was old enough to know right from wrong. Hey, if I'd have died, I would have been in hell today. But thank God, the angel of death, if I could use that analogy, he said, stay, God said, stay his hand. Stay your hand. Stay your hand. How many times should you have been dead, but God stayed his hand? I remember. When I was 17 years old, for three years of my life, listen to me, for three years of my life, I lived with a knife under my pillow, thinking somebody was going to come in and kill me. And at the age of 17, someone broke into our house and said, told my mother, I'm going to kill you, but I'm going to kill your son first. But see, God, even though I was lost, God in his divine providence and mercy had me out to the fair that was in town during that time. And my mother was at the point where she was about to be killed. And said she heard people heard screaming and so forth. Someone started knocking on the door. She got a break to where she was able to push the person away. She got out of that door and she didn't stop running until she hit my grandmother's house. If I had been there, I was only 114 pounds at the time as a senior in high school, and that's another whole story. He was 200 and about 50 to 55 pounds. Can you guess who would have won that fight? But God stayed his hand. He stayed his hand. I could have been dead, but thank God I'm alive. 
Oh, I've got something to praise him for. And you do too. When I was 20, excuse me, 19 years of age, I was out in California. When I was out in California, there were times when I would climb those mountains. Didn't have any sense. <laughs> climb those mountains without any gear. There's times I've looked down and I've seen people and they looked like literally they were about that small. And I said, if I fall from here, there's no way I'm going to survive it. I will tell you something. When you are lost and when you're in a situation like that, you may not have been praying before, but you start to pray. And I was praying and I was praying. I said, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this. And I promise you, I'll go to church. God got me out of it. I didn't go to church. He stayed his hand. He stayed his hand. He stayed his hand. See, sometimes we need to look back. We need to look back. Ordan looked back. He saw that angel. He realized he could have been dead. His sons could have been killed. Oh, it's good to look back sometimes. But praise God at the age of 20 and a half, lying in my bunk, March 1980, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he changed my life. He saved my soul. How could I not but say, I give it all? Jesus is looking for somebody who will say, I give it all. You say, why? Because when he was on the cross, he said in so many words with his life, I give it all. I give it all. Why was Ornan, why did he say, I give it all? Secondly, because he wanted to please his king. He wanted to please his king. Notice chapter 21 and verse number 21. It says, and as David gave to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Listen, Ornan wanted to please his king. You could see the reverence that he had for David. Listen, your pastor is not looking for someone to bow down to him, but he's looking for somebody who has a heart, who wants to serve God. I hadn't even talked to him about this, but I know he has a pastor's heart. And see, I thank God for the members who were here, but I know just like in any church, all of us could go to a greater degree in our commitment to the Lord. And we ought to have some who say, I give it all. See, David Ornan wanted to please his king. Listen, he had a great leader. You ought to want to please your leader and thank God for him. But I'll tell you, there's a leader that you can please. And if you please him, your leader will be pleased. You say, who is that? Not an earthly king, but I'm talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When you get to the place where you say, I'm going to live my life to please my king, then the under shepherd will automatically be pleased. Yes, Jesus said, I do always those things which please the Father. See, our desire ought to be to please our heavenly king. Hey, he's done so much for us. You ought to say, I give it all. I give it all three months ago. Three months ago, I was in a meeting, a conference. I saw Dr. Tom Sexton. I went over and started talking with him, and he and I were communicating, and he told me something. Just in the midst of our conversation, he shared something with me. He said, he said, a preacher who walks with God, he said, knows how to cause people who are in his presence to be calm. Do you know tonight, you've got a preacher like that. Your pastor, like this. They don't grow on trees. You can't pick them every season. He's a unique pastor, and I thank God for him and the very fact 
that I know him. It means a lot. And I tell you, I thank God that I have even the privilege to have a part in what's going on in your life. I thank God for you. Hey, I want to see you have five more years, 10 more years, 15 more years, and I want your years to be glorious. And if that's going to happen, he needs some people who will say, I give it all. You want to please your king, and if you take care of your king, then your pastor will be okay. Everything we do ought to be to please our king. If we preach, it should be to please our king. If you teach, it should be to please your king. If you have any job in the church, it should be to please your king. If you sit on a pew and that's all you do right now, you ought to be the best pew sitter that you could ever be until God opens up something for you to do. You ought to be faithful on Sundays. You ought to be faithful on Wednesdays. And don't let anything deter you from being faithful. Your pastor, he'll stand up. And if he's the average pastor, when he's preaching or when he's up there and singing, he'll be looking around and he's probably saying, Where's brother so-and-so? Where's sister so-and-so? Where's this person? Where's that person? You say, why? Because he carries them on his heart. And that's the kind of man that you want. You wouldn't want to miss for five weeks and show up. And the pastor, he knows I didn't even notice you were gone. You wouldn't want somebody like that. He carries you on his heart. Paul said, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. A pastor has a pastor's heart, and he needs people who will be faithful to him. Years ago, I heard a song. I can't remember who sung the song. It might have been the Kingsman. I don't know. But it went something like this. Excuses, excuses. You'll hear them every day. Some of you, some of you remember that song? And the devil, he'll supply them if from church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Right. Well, a headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night, right. but come work time Monday morning, you feeling quite all right. right. Well, I guess that young kid had a cold pneumonia, do you suppose? Well, I guess it took all five of them just to blow that poor kid's nose. See, what I'm saying is, uh, hey, we need people who are saved by the grace of God, and he needs people who are saved by the grace of God. I'm going to be faithful. My pastor used to say, don't call in sick, crawl in sick. Hey. Yes, sir. Amen. This is the time when we need to be committed. We are committed to the job. We need to be committed to the job of being faithful. Somebody talk to me right there. We need to be faithful. And he needs a group of people who say, like Ornan, I want to please my king. Ornan said, I give it all. I give it all. Oh, listen, when you go to church, you ought to say, Pastor, by your life, I give it all. I give it all. Listen to me. Why was Ornan willing to give it all? Number one, because he was thankful that he was not destroyed. Number two, because he wanted to please his king. And then here's the last one. Number three, because he knew there was a plague in the land. There was a plague in the land. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 22. It says, then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. Do you know one reason why we should all say, I give it all? I'll tell you why. There's a plague in the land. There's a plague in the land. Do you know tonight? You don't have to go very far on the news report to see that there's a plague right. in the land. Yes, sir. Listen, people are dying without Christ. Yes, there's a plague in the land. Yes, 
it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up like a great phoenix out of the desert and say, we're going to give it all. There's a plague in the land. The plague needs to be stayed. And the way for the plague to be stayed is we need to get men and women, boys and girls, under the sound of the gospel, saved, regenerated, born again. Oh, we've got to have an army of people who say, I give it all. The plague needs to be stayed. Oh, will you give it all? There's a plague in the land. There's a plague in the land. We have profanity. We have vice, immorality running rampant across our country, destroying our homes, destroying our families. There's a plague in the land. People are dying all around us, and the majority of them are dying without Christ. One of the hardest things sometimes to do in life is to get somebody to admit that they're lost without Jesus. Listen to me, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to close in a little bit, but I'm going to tell you a story. I was talking, this is years ago now, I was talking to a man, another man in my church, we were talking to a man one day, and we tried to talk this man. I opened the Bible, took him down the Romans road, and, and I like to tie in Luke 16 and, and other passages of Scripture in different places, go back to Genesis, etc., showed how sin came into the world, etc. And when I went through, I asked him, I said, do you want to receive Christ as your Savior? He said, I, I do preach that, but I'm, I'm just not ready. He said, but I, I'm going to come to church on Sunday. This was a Thursday. He said, I'm, I'm coming to church on Sunday. That Sunday never came. That was a Thursday morning. I was talking with him that Thursday night. He went over to his girlfriend's house. She took a knife and plunged it into his chest, and he went off into a Christless eternity. There's a plague! in the land. There's a plague in the land. We need people who say, I give it all. I give it all. I was telling our people this morning, because praise God, there's two sides to every story. I was telling them this morning in a different sermon that I was preaching about how my goodness, a number of years now, about 32 years or so ago, I had my brother-in-law who was a professional weightlifter, professional weightlifter. And I witnessed to him, just he and I in the room took the word of God and witnessed to him. He was sitting on the couch. I was sitting beside him. I weighed about 130-something pounds. He weighed about 230-something to 40-something pounds. I weighed me by a hundred pounds. I looked like a little kid sitting down beside him. I gave him the gospel. He wouldn't get saved, but he got under conviction. See, there's a plague in the land. We need to get people saved. He got under conviction. He started coming to church. He said when he would go to church, he said he would hold on to the pew right about invitation time. He said because he knew how long the invitation would go, so he would hold on to the pew and wait until after the invitation, then he'd let go. He was under conviction. But I said kind of like a, a dope addict, once they get, if I could use this to need, they have to keep coming back. He was under conviction, but he kept coming to church. So one time he said, you know what, I, I need, I'm going to do something a little different. And he went and found out that there was somebody who was having a tent meeting. His name was Ralph Sexton. And so Ralph Sexton was having a tent meeting. And so my, my brother-in-law, my wife's uh, brother-in-law, I mean my, my wife's sister's husband, he went to that meeting. And while he was there, he figured whenever the invitation was coming, was going to be given, he said, I'll, I'll just hold on right here in this tent. But what happened was, Brother Saxton got up, and instead of preaching, he gave the invitation before he preached. Amen. And he said, I didn't have time to steal myself. He gave the invitation. He said, I found myself walking down the aisle. He said, I gave my life to Christ. 
He got saved. I've watched his life over 30 some odd years. I've watched his life. I've never seen him use a curse word, never seen him do wrong. By the way, God just stepped down and called him to preach. He pastors tonight. Hey, there's a plague in the land. He told me, he said, I can't, I can't. And you know, when you're young in the Lord, you don't know how to phrase everything. But he said something on the inside was telling me, I can't get up and model as a professional weightlifter anymore. You know what was happening? The Holy Spirit was saying, you're going to have to put some clothes on this time. Amen? You're going to have to put some clothes on. See, when you get the real deal, it'll clean you up. There's a plague in the land. You don't want to know how we can help stay some things? Let's get fired up about telling people about Jesus Christ. He can save their soul, change their lives. I give it all. I give it all. Where are the old nans who will say, I give my life, I give my children, I give my finances, I give my time, I give my loyalty, I give my strength, I give my heart, I give my praise, I give it all. There's a plague in the land. What a tremendous birthday gift you could give to your pastor. What a tremendous gift you could give to yourself. What a blessing you could be to people in the church and the world uh, if you'll just say like Ordnan, I give it all. As I close, let me say, you can never outgive God. I wonder if Ornan got anything back after he said, I give it all. I wonder if he got anything back. In verse 24 and verse 25, I won't even read them, but he got 600 shekels, not of silver, of gold. When you say, I give it all, God, you can't outgive him. That's right. Amen. And later on, you'll find out that the Solomonic Temple was built on this same land. And all four of his sons and others were spared. We need a group of people tonight yes, who will say, standing shoulder to shoulder with your pastor, I give it. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? When I ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? 
You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.